In AD 4, or thereabouts, Herod the Great died. He was the one who ordered the massacre of all the baby boys in and around Bethlehem. So Herod's son, Archelaus, who like his father is mentioned in the Bible, in Matthew 2, Archelaus headed off to Rome to be invested as the king of Judea in place of Herod the Great. You see, just Judea at that time was part of the Roman Empire, and the Romans appointed various local dignities to be kings or princes, and then they would exercise their government of that region through these men who were sort of puppets, but had a certain measure of control themselves. Moreover, like verse 14, some of the Jewish citizens of Judea hated Archelaus. And they didn't want to see him receive the crown. So they also journeyed off to Rome to plead with the emperor. But the Roman overlord refused to budge. And Archelaus was appointed king of Judea despite their protests. Now, all of this is an interesting historical aside. It doesn't help us as such to interpret the parable, but it does show us that the Jews of Jesus' day were familiar with the idea of a nobleman going off to a far kingdom to receive a kingdom from an overlord. And some of them, when Jesus first uttered this parable, may have pricked up their ears and thought, Oh, he's going to say something about the lineage of Herod. Maybe he's going to take a swipe at the Roman Emperor. So they listened all the more closely. But this much should be said by way of positive identification at this point. The nobleman in the story, not Archelaus, the nobleman is Jesus Christ. He's the one who goes off into a far country. He's the one who returns. He's the one who returns and judges. So almost all the commentators agree. The central character here is Christ. Now the second point of this sermon is entitled the eschatological teaching. Because a vital point in the interpretation of this parable concerns its instruction on the end times. The parables are eschatological, dealing with the principles of the kingdom of heaven to be inaugurated and the return of the Lord. This eschatological side to the parable is evident from the words preceding the parable. Verse 11, As they heard these things, the words that Jesus spoke to Zacchaeus. As they heard these things, he added, here's something more, and spake a parable. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore. So this parable is designed to counteract the false views of the imminent appearing of Christ's kingdom held by many in Christ's audience on that day. See, we need a little bit of background here. By and large, first century Jews in general, but especially in Palestine, held that the coming Messiah would rule over an earthly kingdom. This is easy to understand. Wasn't, they argued, wasn't the Messiah's kingdom typified by the kingdom of David and Solomon? The kingdom of David and Solomon was a united, powerful, and sovereign state. And surely, this is what the Messiah is going to bring in and rule over. And their mistake is evident mistake made by many schools of eschatology, their mistake was to apply the nature of David's earthly kingdom to that of the Messiah 
in a literalistic way. Literalistic way. And then too, the people reasoned, this Jesus, who is the son of David, that was shouted loudly when he was in Jericho, this Jesus works miracles. God is with him. He multiplies loaves and fishes. That would feed our army. In fact, he could do that at will. That would feed our entire populace. Jesus heals the sick and the lame. What an advantage that would be in a military conflict with the Romans. You don't need a mobile army surgical hospital in your train. Jesus will just heal all our soldiers. In fact, with Christ as our king, all our citizens will be fit and well. And didn't Jesus cast out demons? And if he can cast out demons, evil angels, surely he can cast out the Romans as well. Many of the Jews had also misunderstood Jesus' own teaching. He said time and time again, the kingdom of God is upon you. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming. He has been teaching, especially of late, for several weeks now, that something great is going to happen when he comes next to Jerusalem. He's going to lead us against the Romans. He's surely going to re-establish Jewish sovereignty in Palestine. Now think of the situation here in Luke 19. Jesus is heading up to Jerusalem, David's own city, the heart of the kingdom in Israel. He's heading up to it from Jericho no less. Jericho, the first city which Joshua had conquered when Israel came up out of Egypt about 1400 years ago. The start of the reclamation of the land. It's Passover. Passover is the time when we celebrate deliverance from Egypt. Maybe at this Passover we'll celebrate deliverance from Rome. There are vast crowds in Jerusalem up for the feast. Many of whom are favorable to Jesus. Word about him has gotten out near and far. And they will join in. And we will kick out the hated Romans. And recall where Jesus stood at this time. This is the connection between the first ten verses and the next few verses. Jesus here is outside the house of Zacchaeus. The Son of Man has come to seek and to see of that which is lost, including Zacchaeus. And as they heard these things, including this statement that he uttered to Zacchaeus, so it's outside his house, then he speaks the parable. And who was Zacchaeus? A tax collector. For whom did Zacchaeus collect taxes? The Romans. The Romans. And because of Jesus, Zacchaeus had promised to give half his goods to the poor. The Jewish poor. Redistribution of wealth. Redistribution of wealth from Rome and the collaborators with Rome to the Jews. And if Zacchaeus had overtaxed anyone, he said he would restore to that person fourfold. Is not this, is not this, the harbinger of the end to paying taxes to the Roman invader. This is a sign the kingdom's about to come. Their days are numbered. We will take back our land. 